I'm currently creating a giant battery pack for my electric longboard, which I showed you how to build in a previous video. But while I was getting close to finishing the first test with it, I started to notice that while using a very small throttle input, both hub motor wheels do not start spinning at the exact same time, even though both electronic speed controllers get the same PPM signal from the remote control, since the inputs are basically connected in parallel. Of course, such a small misalignment of the unloaded RPMs does not mean that there will be a big power difference between both wheels while driving, since I could not feel anything significant like that during my previous test rides. But just to be on the safe side, I will show you in this video how I used the CAN bus of the FS ESCs in order to fix this problem. And while we're at it, I will also tell you the most important information about the CAN bus and show you where else it is being used. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB, who is currently offering free SMT assembly service for one month, which started at Thanksgiving 2019. So make sure to upload your Gerber files and get your excellent quality PCBs produced within 24 hours for one of the cheapest prices in the industry. When having a look at the documentation of the original VESC, then we can easily find out that the CAN bus port is located next to the mini USB port. Its four pins are labeled as 5V and ground, which are the power lines, and CAN H and CAN L. Now the term CAN is an abbreviation for controller area network. Basically put, it is a serial bus system that allows microcontrollers and devices to communicate with one another through messages without the need of a host computer. And it was firstly used and is still mostly used in cars. You know, I actually just upgraded the music system of my car. And that was the moment I started to wonder how exactly all the buttons, knobs, lights, motors and sensors talk to each other in order to fulfill simple tasks like lifting up a window or more complex tasks like a parking assistant. The answer is obviously the CAN bus, which only requires two wires, known as CAN H and CAN L, in order to connect all electronic control units in a car, which are also known as nodes in a CAN bus. This way all nodes can send messages aka frames to one another, and since this linear bus configuration only requires two wires, we also save quite a bit of copper which makes this system pretty cheap to implement, because the hardware is also not expensive. Now the H stands for high and the L behind CAN for low, but before understanding exactly why, I got myself two 4-pin connectors, which I pushed into the CAN ports of the FS ESCs and whose CAN H and CAN L wires I then soldered together. To activate the CAN functionality of the FS ESCs, I simply had to alter the CAN status message mode in the VESC software, as well as changing the multiple VESCs over CAN option to true. Afterwards, I obviously had to repeat the software procedure with the second FS ESC. And as you can see, even though I removed the RC input wire from one of the FS ESC, both wheels turn perfectly fine, and this time even without any noticeable RPM difference between them. So it was finally time to inspect the CAN H and CAN L voltages on the oscilloscope. And as some of you probably already suspected, the CAN H line swings up to a high voltage while the CAN L line swings down to a low voltage. If we simplify it, a proper part of a CAN bus frame could look something like this. Electrically speaking, the common bus voltage should be between 1.5 and 3.5 volts, and the differential voltage between high and low should be above 2 volts. 
In our case, the common voltage is 2.3 volts, with a high level of 2.9 volts and a low level of around 1 volt, which is certainly good enough. When both lines are actively driven by a CAN transceiver, then the data represents a zero, which is dominant. And when the transceiver is in the idle state, the voltage returns to the common voltage, which represents a one and is recessive. Those keywords dominance and recessive are important for the CAN bus. As an example, let's imagine we got two devices in the CAN bus system of a car that want to send a frame at the exact same time. One of the first things they send out according to the CAN frame protocol is their CAN ID. So as an example, one device has the ID 0 and the other the ID 5. Both start off by sending out lots of zeros. And it is important to note that after every bit transmission, each device reads the voltage lines. And you will see why in a second. Because now the device with the ID 5 sends out a 1, while the device with the ID 0 still sends out a 0. But because the dominant bit 0 is actively driven, it basically overrides the recessive bit 1 voltage values and thus there's a zero on the data line. The ID0 device reads the line and says everything is fine, because I just sent out a zero. But the ID5 device reads the zero, which is obviously not at send out bit 1, and realizes that there's another device also attempting to send, with a lower ID and thus a higher priority. At this point, the ID5 device stops its transmission and will only restart it after the ID0 device is done talking. In a nutshell, that means that the CAN bus features an ID based priority system, which prevents collision errors between devices. Almost the last big advantage of the CAN bus can be found if we look at a typical CAN frame. Like already stated, we got the CAN ID, as well as the actual data we want to transmit. But also 16 bits for cyclic redundancy check and 2 bit for an acknowledge. Those bits allow the transmitter and receiver to check whether the correct data was being transmitted. Which makes the CAN bus frame protocol pretty error free. Combine that with the fact that the data wires come as a twisted pair and use a differential voltage and you got yourself a pretty robust system which is actually kind of similar to the RS485 data transmission I talked about in a previous video. With that I mean that it is also half duplex, which means a device can either send or receive data but not simultaneously. It is asynchronous, which means there's no clock line and thus all devices synchronize themselves depending on the set baud rate and the time point when a voltage change occurs. There's no standardized connector and they both require termination resistors, whose location and value slightly alter for the CAN bus depending on what kind of CAN bus you are working with. There exists high speed CAN with speeds of up to 1 megabit per second low speed CAN with 125 kilobit per second and CAN FD with 5 megabit per second. But since talking about each of them in detail here, or how exactly the CAN frame protocol looks like, would be a bit too much, I highly recommend you to check out the linked articles in the video description in order to find out more about the subject. But anyway, with the most important information being in your head now, I reassembled my electric longboard, whose wheels not only react identical now, but also feature traction control. Simplified speaking, this feature matches the power consumption and RPM of the wheels, and thus the board should have better traction in for example curves or in muddy terrain. And with that being said, my electric longboard improvement was complete. And I hope that you learned a bit about what the CAN bus can do and why it was an important step for car electronics and everything involved with them. 
And by the way, there also exist handy CAN controller slash transceiver boards online, which you can easily connect to an Arduino in order to read or write from or to a CAN bus and thus send out control data or read data in order to add a bit of extra functionality to an existing system. But that is a subject for another video. Until then, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hitting the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!